A. Uh, this presentation is geared towards both uh, business-minded technologists and technology-minded business people. Uh, our company, uh, Anand Corporation, focuses on streamlining, organizing, and unifying business information so that businesses can save money, save time, and uh, be more effective and efficient. Today's topic is about building online software um, with uh, existing tools, um, how to iterate from a very minimum viable product towards uh, something more substantial. And the goal is to give you guys the terminology and some references to the tools uh, so that you can on your own uh, expand your knowledge. Uh, and then uh, I also hope to talk about specific technologies and answer questions that you guys may have um, and serve as a resource. So go ahead, uh, to go ahead and get started, uh, this presentation is, um, it's, it, it could be, it could take me about two hours to go through everything, but um, I think the, the, the minutia of some of the technology stuff could really bore you guys. So I'm going to go through it as, as, as quickly as I can. There's a quick demo that I'm also going to do uh, to demonstrate what, what can be done in a few hours if you're using the right tools. So at our company, we, we generally solve problems with a very, very basic approach. And uh, that's because we always want to be on the bleeding edge. So when we come across a problem, we ask, you know, what are you trying to do? What's, what is stopping you currently? Uh, what others have done and won? Uh, and what are your options? And what, the reason we ask those two questions, what have others done and won, and what are your options, is that coming into a situation especially in technology, things change so fast that what we knew two weeks ago may be irrelevant or obsolete. And at the end of the day, our recommendation comes down to what is the urgency, what is the need, and what are you trying to do? Well, in business applications, uh, it, it comes down to understanding your business. Um, and understanding your business is, is different for every business. So a nonprofit may have... Uh, a fundraising campaign. A, a for-profit may want to uh, give access to people uh, to their database, or uh, a government institution might want to give citizens access to certain processes, like getting their business license. Um, in terms of you know building with existing technology, um, I, I, I always use the term we you know we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. We should really be building airplanes or jet engines we really shouldn't be reinventing the wheel but in technology what happens is that if when people stay stagnant and they're not seeing what what the rest of the world is doing um, people get into their grooves we'll also talk a little bit about launching the app so let's say you do create something how do you continue going forward and you know launching and maintaining an application actually uh, relates directly to the choices you make early on so uh, we'll get into that as well my demonstration is uh, it's very simple. Um, what I will show is how to put together a very simple form, um, and we're gonna you know uh, use something that everybody knows how to use. And we'll get to that in a second. And uh, we're gonna use one of our open source uh, portal frameworks, uh, Appleseed Portal, to basically demonstrate how to put things together. And uh, this knowledge isn't um, you know applicable just to what we do. It really could be done on any portal or any web-based content management system, uh, what we want to demonstrate here is if you use the right tools, they should let you do what you need to do without too much programming. And in the beginning, that's really the goal. Can you, without too much programming or too much effort, put together something, get feedback from your end users so that you can iterate your, your business processes and make it more efficient before investing the time and effort and testing and the branding um, to, to make a commercial quality product. And that's generally known in today's world as both in the, in the software world as agile methodology, uh, but also in the business world as the lean startup methodology. So understanding your business. Being a technologist, uh, as we got into it, um, many of us were, were thrown into it looking at it from a systems uh, up approach. This system can do X, Y, Z. This information can be stored on this particular database. 
uh, this system has this feature. So we can make this application in Windows, we can make this application in Java, and, and at the end of the day, um, all that does is is really create toys. You know, technologists love to create toys. They love to make new things with the technologies that they have. Well, I read a book. Uh, it's been about uh, 11 or 12 years ago called Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And Inmates Are Running the Asylum is a book by uh, Alan Cooper. Alan Cooper is the guy who designed uh, Visual Basic. And Visual Basic changed the world. It, it gave people an, uh, uh, you know, a, a visual way to program applications on Windows. And so much of what he created is now in today's uh, you know, best ID, integrated development environment called Visual Studio. Um, and you know, he left Microsoft because Bill Gates just wanted to get stuff done and get it out the door and sell it. And he really wanted to perfect the software. Well, in Inmates Are Running the Asylum, he talks about a goal directed approach or goal oriented approach to creating software that is people oriented. And that's what we've adopted is that when we think about building software, specifically if it's uh, for businesses, we were to think about it from a people um, standpoint. Who are the people? What processes or what are they trying to do? Uh, what information do they need to, to store or manage in order to execute their process? And then what systems uh, could be used to manage that information? Now, systems, they are a very important part of the puzzle. When you use the right systems, it helps people do what they need to do, such as manage information and execute their process as well. If you use the wrong systems, it becomes a pain in the neck. To talk a quick, quickly about uh, some terminology here, when we mention uh, building with existing technology, well, there's different types of technologies, and I'm going to be talking about interfaces, software, databases, and systems um, frequently, and, and, and in subsequent webinars, we'll, we'll cover this. Um, it's just something that, you know, if you're going to be in the business of software, um, you should really understand these concepts because whether you're a technologist or you're a business person, you're going to be dealing with technologists or you're going to be dealing with technology. And it's good to know the, uh, the, the right term. So at least in our company's terminology, which we didn't invent, we just kind of assembled it together. Uh, an interface uh, generally is, is user interface for people. There's also application programming interfaces called APIs. But when, when, we, when we say interfaces, we're talking about let's say a web interface or a desktop interface or maybe a mobile or tablet interface. Um, and in, a, in an interface framework, uh, it, there, there are also systems basically that encapsulate a lot of functionality. So systems, I'll keep coming back to systems. Systems are complete systems. Um, software uh, can be in the form of a framework. It could be procedures, it could be patterns, it could be libraries. But essentially when you're creating new software, uh, you're 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 innovating a, a business process, or you're you're making a business process more efficient with business rules, um, and and you can do that on on several software frameworks, and we'll get to that in a second. And a database, uh, up until about ten years ago, mostly were relational databases, and now we have something called non-relational databases. Um, we'll talk about the differences uh, when when I get to databases, but at the end of the day. Any complete system that you use today has all of these components. It has some sort of database, it has some sort of software, it has some sort of interface, uh, and these are you know, three layers. In today's world, you also have to think about working with external systems. So your system that you're creating may be connected to other systems, and that's where it gets complex. But hopefully this webinar uh, series will help you understand um, and innovate with the best tools out there. So in interfaces, what's the goal? Uh, that's where you should start with. What's the goal? Um, you know, and when you're designing an interface, really you should be designing for personas, designing for the pleasure of the people that are using your software. Uh, yes, in the beginning it may be a rough uh, wireframe, but you can get feedback um, and from a user to say, you know, I would like this form to be on the right side, and I want this report to be on the left side, or I want this menu here. So without even creating anything digitally, you could you could get feedback from your personas. Um, you also want to design for power to meet people's goals. So yes, 
uh, uh, you may want to give them certain information, and yes, you may want to receive some information, but their goals may be different than just giving and receiving information. Their goals may be to get their job done faster, or their goals may be to, to have fun doing while doing their job. Uh, and if you look at software today, it's changed over the last uh, at least 15, 20 years that, that I've been in this industry, where software that used to be very, very kludgy, uh, that's a term we use, <laughs> very kludgy, has become more refined. It's, it, it, it doesn't require you to save, it automatically saves. Or it gives you unlimited undos because it's possible today with that technology. Um, you know, you can store massive amounts of data online because storage is so cheap. So software has become powerful um, and it allows people to get their job done better. And then lastly, we should design software for people. What are the scenarios that they're going to be, you know, um, be, what are, the, what are the scenarios that they're going to be in? So there's four scenarios that you should consider when you're building online software. So one is how are they going to find out about it? And, and that relates a little bit to your, your marketing, but uh, when they are uh, made aware of it, when they do come to your application, uh, you know, how do they, how, what do they get? What, what do they understand with, with, when it's the first thing that they see? The next scenario is sign up, which is how easy is it for them to onboard uh, excuse me, how easy is it for them to sign up using your software? Um, Slack has a uh, excellent sign up. All it asks, asks you for is your username and or, or the team name, and it just creates it for you, and then it asks you for your email. Once it asks you for an email, you're in. You don't even have to give it a password. It's the simplest sign up I've ever seen. They get your password later, so their sign up process is very easy. Um, the the next scenario you should you should think about is Onboarding. How easy is it for your users to onboard onto your software? So onboarding is different from sign up. Onboarding means can they go in, fill out their profile? Can they go in and put in their preferences? Are you going to guide them through that process? Are you going to show them uh, on a video or a, or a slide deck how to do it? And then finally, ongoing. How are they going to use your software on an ongoing basis? So signing up, onboarding, and ongoing are three different scenarios. And if you have an idea storyboarded out in a wireframe or, or, or whatnot, even before you create the software, when you start to build it, it'll make more sense to the users. Interface frameworks that are available today um, can save tremendous amounts of information. And... You know, when you're using something like Zoho or Salesforce or NAC or Canvas Forms, you don't need to know these frameworks. But eventually, if you're going to create a high quality business application, um, you're going to end up using one of these interface frameworks. What these interface frameworks do um, is allow you to build really good interfaces, again, without reinventing the wheel. So, what Bootstrap has done is given uh, people worldwide a basic a set of uh, navigation elements, buttons that essentially um, can be styled to look very, very good. And there's there are themes out there, uh, bootstrap themes. As that's one of the questions I ask is if there's something that I want to build, is there a bootstrap theme that could help me do it? Um, and then to to give the and an, to give the interface a very smooth um, feature, you know, Gmail like functionality. Um, there's about three uh, frameworks that I would put at the top of my list. There's several more, uh, and that's up for discussion. But uh, AngularJS is backed by Google. Some guys at Google made it, and uh, it's very, very popular today. Um, it can be used with any backend framework. React is made by Facebook. Uh, it competes directly with Angular, although AngularJS, the next version, is going to do most of the features that React has. React does not have as many plugins available, but it's, it's pretty strong. And then jQuery is the, uh, the veteran in this field. Uh, jQuery is a slightly a lower level library, uh, and they also have something called jQuery UI um, that competes uh, somewhat with uh, AngularJS and React. And all of these can be used with Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is more of the HTML, CSS, the look and feel, whereas Angular, React, and jQuery are the functionality of the interfaces. Software um, essentially connects interfaces together. So when you go from one interface to another, really what you're doing is you're walking through a workflow. 
And some examples of that are, as I mentioned, completing an online profile, paying an invoice, completing uh, a workflow for, let's say, an application. Um, for example, grants management. There's a workflow when uh, a foundation needs to see a grant all the way through. Um, and there's lots of software available that helps you do specific things. So if you have a customer-oriented workflow, you'd want to use a CRM. If you have a case or ticket-oriented workflow, then you want to use a ticket system or support desk software. Um, and on the right of what I have here are mostly open. This is actually all open source software available today that can do maybe 80% of what you want to do. Now, it's not going to be goal-directed, right? This is a systems up question. What can this software do? Um, but if you combine the goal-directed design with what software is available, then maybe you can get 80% of the work, uh, way there. Uh, so, so, so a few examples. There's a lot. These are a, a lot of CMSs here. Some e-commerce uh, packages, uh, the browser operating systems, uh, and you know databases and programming frameworks. Uh, and and open source continues to grow, but you don't need to be limited to open source. Um, and when we talk about systems, we, we can talk about platforms as a service or software as a service options as well. What are the software frameworks available? Um, there are many, but um, generally the, the, the enterprises, the larger organizations, uh, they stick to Java uh, and the Microsoft uh, stacks, where Java is now owned by Oracle. Uh, Google uses it. Basically, any large system is, is backed uh, by Java. Uh, and then Microsoft uh, has created .NET. It's recently open sourced it. Uh, it runs on Mac, Linux, and uh, Windows now. So it's a direct competitor to Java. Scala is a relatively um, less uh, used language. It, it actually runs on, runs on top of Java. There's use cases for that. Node.js is, is popular nowadays. It's a JavaScript-based server-side framework, uh, very elegant, uh, very fast for certain things. Uh, LinkedIn actually moved a lot of their uh, APIs to Node.js because it, it does something called microservices really well. Uh, everybody talks about Ruby on Rails. Um, I personally think it's good for certain things, but when a system needs to grow large, um, there's a lot of tweaking that needs to be done. So for example, Twitter used Ruby on Rails to build their initial product, and then eventually they moved to Scala. Uh, and in the Python world, so what you'll see here is that there's a programming language, and then there's a framework. So Microsoft.NET is actually a, a, a framework which has many languages, and then Microsoft ASP.NET is a web framework on top of Microsoft.NET. Play is a framework on top of Scala. Um, there are other frameworks for Node.js. In the PHP world, there are two good ones, I think, CodeIgniter and Laravel. Uh, Ruby is the language. Ruby on Rails is the framework. Django is the framework. Python is the language. So if somebody says they know Python, they may not know how to make a website with Python. But if they say they know Django, they can make a website or a web app. Databases are probably the most complex uh, pieces of software uh, that people use day to day, and they don't realize how powerful it is. Um, uh, we, we, we live and breathe on, on systems that are built on databases. Um, until recently, uh, I would say 10, 15 years ago, a SQL or relational databases were the most common. So they store data in tables and columns. They're very popular. Um, it works for most of the most of the use cases. Um, if you use Microsoft Access, that's a relational database. The data structure in Microsoft Access can scale to PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, um, and the language to retrieve and update that information is pretty much the same. Every every one of these vendors, they have their own slight variant of, of uh, SQL. SQL stands for Structured Query Language, but for the most part, the same queries can work. NoSQL um, is also referred to as not only SQL or non-relational, and there is no standard way to ask NoSQL uh, questions because every NoSQL database is different. Uh, some of them are document stores, meaning a document in the sense not like a Word document, but rather a structured or unstructured 
uh, text that may have fields that change. A graph databases, uh, they store uh, nodes and edges. Key value stores, they store values uh, in a specific uh, ID. And I know this is pretty technical, um, but what I wanted to show is that NoSQL requires uh, some planning, but it's great for massive data and it's great for changing structures. So there's a reason um, both Amazon and Facebook created their own uh, NoSQL databases to scale uh, with what they wanted to do. Um, so, you know, Amazon created DynamoDB and uh, actually Google also created their own NoSQL database um, because structured uh, relational databases, they can't scale as well. It assumes in, in the relational world that you have to have all your data in one massive machine uh, in order for you to run the query. Whereas in the NoSQL world, because of the way the data is structured, you can store it on hundreds of servers. There is, I would say, one database which I think tries to marry the two concepts well, and that's Cassandra. Um, but generally speaking, you can use one of these databases and, and do 80%, 90% of what you're trying to do unless you achieve the scale of Google, Facebook, or Amazon. And you need to consider these other options. Systems. So this is an excellent chart that I did not make, but it explains, um, you know, fundamentally what is cloud. So in in the old days, traditional IT, um, if you weren't wanted to create an online uh, software, you would have to get the internet, you would have to have your storage, you'd have to have hardware, you'd have to have some sort of uh, virtualization, you'd have to virtual machines on top of it, you'd have your own databases. You have to figure out your security, your, your framework, your, and then your applications would sit on top of it. With companies like Amazon, they manage the networking, the storage, the server hardware, and the virtualization. And you're responsible for managing everything up from here. The platforms as a service, they make it really easy for you. If you have some custom code, uh, all you need to do is manage your code. That's it. Everything else is managed by the vendor. And finally, software as a service, you really don't have to manage any code. All you have to do is use your software. So good software as a service, you can achieve with clicks what you're trying to do rather than code. And that's Salesforce's model, and Zoho has it too, which is clicks, not code. Can you get 80% of the way there with clicks, not code? So examples of uh, infrastructure as a service providers, Amazon, Rackspace, uh, Microsoft Azure. In the platform as a service world, uh, there's Heroku. Heroku was the first one that really made it popular. Uh, Amazon itself has some uh, platform as a service features, but it's still pretty technical. Uh, Microsoft Azure also has a platform as a service offering, and then there's several more, um, you know, specialized ones for Java or Node or, or Rails. Heroku, between Heroku and Azure, you're, you're pretty much there. Uh, you probably don't need to look anywhere else. Um, and then recently with, with something called Docker, um, Docker makes it easy for you to create your own platform as a service um, without having to invest that type of research and development that Heroku and Amazon and Azure has put in. Software as a service, some examples are, uh, you know, simple tools like Basecamp uh, or FreshBooks. Um, or more complex software like Salesforce and Zoho. Um, Google Apps is a software as a service. It's a collaborative suite. So the cloud economy is built uh, generally now on one on top of uh, another. Heroku, which is a platform as a service, runs on top of Amazon. There are several apps like Lyft that run on top of Salesforce and Heroku. So don't think that using one of these things is, is, is a cop out. The largest companies in the world are, you know, embracing the idea that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, that there's other things out there that can make their jobs easier. Now, this is a uh, an old graphic. So and this is not even the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of how many different types of SAS, PaaS, and, and IaaS options there are out there. Um, 
it, it really is mind boggling. And, and that's why um, knowing about what is out there, spending the time to research it will save you inordinate amounts of time and effort. If there's something that you can add to, let's say, let's say you're trying to build what Lyft has, right? So Lyft uses Salesforce to manage the workflows for their drivers. And then it has a custom application that they built to talk to their Salesforce database. But in between Salesforce and their custom application, they use something called Heroku Connect. And what Heroku Connect does is it synchronizes the Salesforce information to a Postgres database hosted on Heroku. And their custom application can talk to that Postgres data database as if, as if it was just a regular database. That one component, if they were to write API calls directly to Salesforce, it would be way more complicated. It would be much more of a pain in the neck to maintain over time. So there's little, and by the way, Heroku Connect just does, um, you know, Salesforce to Postgres. There are other uh, vendors out there that can synchronize Zoho CRM to both MySQL and Postgres and SQL Server. Um, uh, that same vendor, I think it's called Skyvia. They they can also synchronize BigCommerce, Salesforce, Zoho, uh, about 30 other uh, tools to whatever database you, you want. And that makes life a lot easier for you because you essentially have taken the power of that software and included it into your software. So quickly talk about launching and, and maintaining before I get into the, to the demo. So if you're going to use a software as a service, the benefit here, main benefit here is no need to maintain any software, providers doing everything for you. We talked about that earlier. If you're using a platform as a service to make a custom application, you don't need to, uh, you know, maintain any of the databases uh, or the systems that's generally managed by the provider. All you have to do is maintain your interface and your software code, um, and you're, you're pretty much good to go. And then if you're using an infrastructure as a service like Amazon, you have to maintain most of everything. Although you do it over the Internet, you don't have to go into a data center and reboot servers like I had to do in my first hosting business. Um, essentially, you give you a, a web-based console to restart servers, but... You have to be pretty technical to, to do that. And by the way, being technical shouldn't stop you from using one of these other technologies. It just puts your mind uh, into something more efficient. Um, somebody else has solved the problem, so you know, use their solution. It's a quick demonstration to show um, you know, using a software as a service and a, a platform as a service to put together a simple collection and retrieval um, workflow. So I'm going to just talk about the workflow. I want to collect client touch points and how the client uh, is doing. Are they happy? Are they unhappy? Um, and uh, I want another group of people to just see the, the trend uh, overall. What, you know, what, how are the ratings coming in from the, from the clients? Um, I, I need a simple interface to collect this information. And I need another interface to show this uh, in, a, in a graph. So if we wanted to actually make this as a custom application, we'd have to create the database. We'd have to create the software that collects the data. We'd have to create a, a web interface that talks to the API layer. And even the, the best programmers using all of the automation tools out there, if they weren't were going to make a, a new tool, it would take them maybe a couple, maybe an hour, maybe a couple of hours. Um, and what I'm about to show you took me about 15 minutes this morning, um, and, and I can go in and do it uh, um, probably step by step uh, another time, but I think most people know how to use Google Forms and spreadsheets, uh, and all I'm really going to show you is uh, our Appleseed portal, how it embedded these uh, forms into a portal and made it available to my company. So our Google um, Forms app here is very basic. There's about three questions that it's asking. You know, when, what's the date? And, you know, if you want to add another question, you can add it right here. Um, who? So I have a, a drop down that I've made with, you know, five uh, companies that we'd like to, to have as our clients. Um, and then client sentiment, just, you know, it's a linear scale. 
uh, one to five. Most form builders, like Zoho app creator, Zoho forums, um, they're, they're very similar to this. The Salesforce app builder is a little bit more complex. It's a little bit more powerful. Um, so Zoho forms and Google forms are a one-to-one. -one. Salesforce apps and Zoho apps are probably more one-to-one. -one. Once I've made my, um, my form, I can go ahead and hit send. And what I wanna do here is really embed it somewhere. So I'm gonna embed this URL. I can always go to this URL if I open up the browser. And I can see the form, I'll, I'll see the form and I can test it. But if I wanted to embed it into my uh, site, I can go here and just say embed. And I can copy and paste this. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy it. And in my Appleseed portal, uh, which I'm gonna log off for a second. So this is just our, our company website. This is the dev environment. This is not our, web, our, our live website. Um, I'm just going to log in as one of the personas, which is the, the builder, and and I've already built this out, so I'm just going to show you There we go. Um, and, and this is our, our, our open source portal software. And each page in this uh, site is, is a module. So this is a module. Uh, this is a this is a module and it's just it's just HTML content. But what I've made here is um, a special page just to show you how to embed a widget uh, into into our portal. And right now we're using Google Forms. But if tomorrow I wanted to use a, a different um, forms engine, I could go and replace what I have here. And my end users, they wouldn't have to go to a new website because they would just get to the same website. They would be at the same page and they would see uh, the, the form. Now I'm, I'm, I'm logged in. Um, what I'm, hmm, let's see, go ahead and make sure my form is set up here. Make sure I have the right URL. So uh, one slight thing that I'm doing is I'm, I'm just putting the, the URL that they gave me, not the whole iframe code. And an iframe is just, it's called an, uh, an internet frame. Uh, I don't know exactly what it stands for. It's basically, it's you take another site and you can embed it into your page. So if there's a Google form or a Zoho form or, uh, and I might have to, to log off um, to, to show you, uh, this working and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to allow all users to see this. And I'm going to go to this here. So this form that I made in Google Forms is now embedded into my site. Um, I've made a very simple application. I published it to the web and I'm taking some data in from the user without thinking. And this form took five minutes. I copied and pasted it, it's embedded. Um, I also have a graph here that is, it can be embedded from Google Apps. If you go to your spreadsheet where it's storing data, um, you can go to your graph here. You can publish it. And in the same way, you can publish it as an interactive graph or as an image, and I've actually chosen to show you uh, both ways. So this is the image, and this is the interactive graph. And uh, at least using our software, um, you can protect the report from one group of users and then make sure that the form is available to another group of users. So that's the demonstration of how to build a quick uh, you know, MVP using two pieces of software. So Appleseed Portal is open source and uh, Google Forms is a software as a service. And I've been able to make one workflow in our company more efficient um, without spending too much time. So at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the screen and uh, allow you guys to ask questions.
can you uh, this is can you hear me now yes sir yep so I was very interested in the uh, user interface uh, aspect of uh, mm -hmm. of development and I think that's probably well I and mean, all these all these things are very important I want to thank you for presenting today it's I've, I've learned so much um, can you can you talk about uh, the process of in a little more detail of developing a user interface and what the options are, sure. um, and and what you want to think about when you're evaluating your users, whether it's the level of sophistication, uh, authentication and security, what users should, how do you control what users see what information? Uh, do you make, for example, with Zoho Creator? Would you make a would you um, have a user sign up as a user of Zoho Creator, or would you push that information out to uh, a separate uh, dashboard that's off of Zoho that would have forms and reports that would be publicly available? Those sorts of things. Sure. So specifically with with Zoho, the and and Zoho is one of those platforms where they they already have many applications that they uh, have built on top of their Creator platform. Um, so Zoho Forms, the, the purpose of Zoho Forms is if you wanted to collect data from the public or lots of users and your main goal is collecting information. And in that, in that use case, um, it's more like Google Forms. It's just a little bit better. Uh, it has more validation functionality that may be relevant to your business. Um, Zoho App Creator has a concept of users that have, you can also have something called a customer portal, where you can show them certain forms uh, or certain objects where they can fill out information. You can also show them certain reports. So if the majority of the information that you're putting in is, you know, structured, like um, name, date, email, some text, um, you know, app creator can make a, a decent interface. It's when you want to create that slick interface uh, and you want it to be mobile that you may want to consider a few other options. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you uh, another tool. So this this is a company called Canvas, uh, and their, their website is called Go Canvas. Their main uh, kind of competitive advantage is that if you're an organization you're, and you want to push certain forms out to your team members or your employees or your vendors or your clients, uh, their web-based app builder automatically publishes to a specific mobile app. Now, it's not a branded app, but it gets the job done. And so both Canvas and Zoho, they're, they are generally customizable, and you may be able to put your logo up there. But but the, for the most part, it's it's a co-branded app. People know that it's 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 running on at least with Canvas. People know that it's running on there. If you want to get rid of all potential, um, you know, you you don't want anybody to know that you're running on top of Zoho or Canvas. That's when the APIs that Canvas and Zoho provide can be leveraged by uh, either Angular JS or React directly. So, you know, if you Google AngularJS and Salesforce APIs, um, there's, Salesforce has an example on that. And that that is a custom made user interface that is talking directly to Salesforce. Or let's say if we look for AngularJS and Zoho Creator API. And uh, so, so Zoho does not necessarily have a um, uh, a tutorial uh, on it, but it is definitely possible because if it's possible okay. on on Salesforce, it's it's definitely possible on Zoho. Uh, I don't I don't know if that starts to answer your question, but yeah, it does. Okay, got it. All right, excellent. Yeah, that, no, that's that's exactly uh, what I was looking for um, because some of these tools on the back end, yeah. they're easy for a layperson to use in terms of creating forms, right. but companies may want to have a customized user interface that goes beyond right. the somewhat basic capabilities that are provided uh, within the, I guess you you would, and I'm not a 
software engineer, but in the Zoho environment sure. or the Salesforce environment or right. um, or NAC, for example. Sure. So so for so they have actually uh, Salesforce has open sourced that particular code and uh, right. and that's amazing. Actually, Salesforce does a good job of that. Whenever they they show something off, they say this is how you do it. Um, another uh, but so by the way, Salesforce and App Creator are giving you something more than just you know data storage. They're giving you some workflow abilities and permissions. There's a slightly lower level uh, service uh, called a backend as a service. And what a backend as a service does is it allows you to um, create very you know it allows you to create objects similar to in Salesforce and in Zoho and it allows your application to save data and retrieve data back from it with an API. So it basically creates your API layer and that that could be a potential way to do uh, what you want to do. If, if, you, if, if the workflow that CRM or uh, sorry Salesforce and Zoho give you are not important then you can use something else. So okay. yeah, so this is this is called Kinvi. Kinvi is a decent one, um, and you know um, they have excellent case studies on here. Um, I wish I could show you the the screenshots of the the building tool. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, a lot of these technology companies, they don't really know how to sell their core value. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've realized that. I just had a call with uh, another one of them yesterday. Yeah, and like, yeah, I, I don't I don't get that, but uh, especially yeah. when it's like a company like Salesforce and that's their whole, their whole thing is CRM, <laughs> but uh, their salespeople don't really know how to yeah. talk to business people. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bob, um, uh, I don't know if you're on, but but Bob actually yeah, works. Yeah, I am. Yeah, Bob, you work with Salesforce, and um, I, I was curious, you know, what you think about Salesforce versus Zoho versus something like a backend as a service when when you're trying to make a new online application. I mean, Salesforce. I mean, it, it's very slick. It, it's it's one of the most complete packages in terms of uh, you know what you can do with it. Um, but um. You know, you know uh, Zoho. I haven't worked with quite as much. My impression of it is that it's not quite as full featured, but you know, it's free, and also they're a little a little more flexible as to what you can do with it. Um, I, I was kind of laughing when you when you did the uh, the Google uh, the Google Forms uh, um, demonstration because I recently did the opposite of that with an iframe. Um, I was in a situation where I had a, uh, a platform as a service I was using, in my case, uh, Teachable for our online course site, mm -hmm. and um, they don't have data storage or, or much flexibility. So I did the opposite with an iframe. Instead of having something simpler in, it, uh, in an iframe in a more complicated uh, portal like you did with yours, we had a, a simple portal named Teachable, and we put something complicated in it. We had uh, we had an iframe opening up into an, an app that we made in our own uh, <laughs> in our own site in PHP, and we had it. We were passing in variables using JavaScript. Oh, um, awesome. <laughs> it, yeah. So it, you know, they're, they're, I love iframes. They're, they're they're such a kludge, but they're <laughs> but but they're they're so handy for doing things that this that the software service people didn't intend for you to be able to do. Right, right. Yeah, and, and by the way, the iframes, the, that little hack of an iframe, um, I remember in as big companies as Merrill Lynch, we would, you know, integrate into, so Merrill Lynch used to offer something, it still offers, it's called Benefits Online. So we were part, I was part of the technical architecture group. And so if somebody wanted to embed the Benefits Online system, like Walmart wanted to embed it, they would be able to embed it into their portal. And then people would go into their Walmart intranet, go to benefits, and they would automatically be inside benefits online. Well, and then inside benefits online. So it's it's not just something that's a kludge. I think that if you use it right, it's it's really like a it's it's a right it's a right window oh, yeah. at the right time. It's great. Um, well, you know, I saw I, I, I wish I could remember where I saw it, but um I used to work for a place where a guy a guy was really big on using iframes for stuff, and he had a cool library that he found that he liked to use where it would actually let you put an iframe 
in in a page and it would put it in a window uh, like like a like a like a Microsoft Windows style window with an X with a minimizing oh, where you could right. move it around the browser right and it, it was the, it was the it was the greatest thing you could ever see because you could have like three iframes and you could actually move them around inside your browser like like they were programs right right um, yeah it, there's a lot of possibility with uh, you know iframes and um, there's a lot of tools out there. Actually, we're we're working on a, a project proposal where we're basically saying get the data into Zoho, then use uh, the sync. You know, Skyvia, by the way, is the uh, I just remembered. Uh, Skyvia is the the synchronization service that can synchronize uh, these other uh, SaaS systems um, into certain databases. So Salesforce, NetSuite, uh, into Postgres, SQL Server, et cetera. Um, and then using a, uh, another, another open source tool called Metabase, um, I believe that is the URL, to make uh, easy reporting available to their end users. So it goes end to end. Zoho gets the data into Zoho, Sakaivia synchronizes it with a database, and Metabase is able to give people, uh, you know, a, a uh, an online business intelligence tool, and the whole system you can do without any programming. And then if you wanted to put the Zoho form side by side to the, you know, to the Metabase dashboards, you can just embed, you can just embed using an iframe. On one page you have the for Zoho forms, and on another page you have the Metabase dashboard widgets. Um, so for business users, this is going to get better and better. I think people are starting to understand uh, uh, the idea of a microservice is not just an API, but serving up a little widget is also a, micro, a little microservice and giving the power to the business users uh, to, to be able to construct things uh, without programming. And it's really ironic that I'm saying this, but I, I would like tools that don't require programmers to program, but rather totally. re require people to put things together um, because programming is a really it's literally just the, 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 unless you're solving some some very hard math problem, programming is not that complicated. It's really just like Lego blocks, but you're typing it out. But if you can do it with your user interface, with dragging and dropping and you know clicking, uh, that's a much better experience for everybody. Much better experience to manage uh, it for for people as well. Well, I mean, you know, even with programmers, you know, they they you know, ideally you want to do as little stuff as on your own as you want to. I mean, you don't want to uh, and reinvent the uh, the wheel. Um, you know, I mean, when I when I started out in my first programming job, you know, I was like all about you know, I had that mindset from school about you know, you write whatever you need, and then over time you realize that your first step is not programming it yourself. Your first step is checking on Google and see if someone wrote a jQuery plugin that already does it. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that, that's just that's just that's you know, I, a lot of coders tend to feel like that's cheating, but it's not. It's you know, it's it's smart time management to check whether you're doing something common that everyone's already done for you. Someone's already done for you. Yeah, th that's 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 right. Um, I, I started out the same way, and you know, the fir one of the first things that I will do is uh, I'll go to GitHub and I'll look there. So yeah. you know, get and and really the this building online software today is about Finding, I, I call it software math. It's this software plus this software plus this software on top of this platform. And if if you can find something that does, you know, for one feature, 50%, you may be able to find another uh, software that does the other 50%. And all you have to do is put it together. Um, so just to quickly um, round out the uh, the presentation. Um, I, you know, obviously, the, the goal of this webinar is uh, to teach you guys, but also wanted to, uh, you know, reiterate what we as a company do. Uh, if you haven't already seen uh, through the webinar uh, where our expertise lies, but essentially, we we curate, we pick what works uh, at the right situation. Uh, we tend to recommend to host on the cloud; uh, it's reliable. Um, we are open source, um, so if if we are building something, it's open source. Generally, we we only ask our clients to, to to pay for our support. Uh, we offer maintenance. So as your business grows uh, and you continue to iterate, um, we, can, we can help you. And uh, management, um, sometimes 
a solution does require a cloud like Amazon, we can definitely manage that as well. Um, the uh, no, the, at the end of the day, what we're doing is streamlining data, organizing it, and unifying it so that your business users are able to succeed at their goals to make their life easier. And if it's a customer, if they're happy with you, they're able to, to come back and recommend you to others. So that's all for today, folks. I appreciate you guys joining us um, on a Friday morning. And uh, if you guys have any uh, other questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, there's Rahul at anant.us, but there's also uh, solutions at anant.us if you want to talk to somebody else. Um, and uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be uploading this presentation to uh, YouTube and sending it out to everybody else. Uh, the presentation itself will be put on SlideShare and also sent out. And uh, I will also actually send you a feedback form to get some feedback on today's session, uh, basically what worked, what didn't work, and what could be improved. Our goal is to do one webinar per month uh, as part of a series uh, alternating between uh, building online software and connecting internet software, uh, because we feel that those are the two things that people need the most. Um, and not immediately, but we also plan on having some uh, workshops where uh, people can come in and plan out their whole application and maybe build something by the time we're done. So thank you very much, cool. and um, hope you guys have a wonderful, uh, wonderful weekend. Appreciate it. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, you too. Great presentation. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brian. Bye,